just scanning your attention through your body to check if there's any tightness or tension or constriction in the body. And if you notice any tightness, just deliberately relaxing, checking the area around your eyes, your forehead, your neck and shoulders. your belly, just moving your attention through your body, deliberately relaxing. And then just taking a moment to feel the weight of your body in the chair, the connection to the earth, even if it's through a floor or even a few stories. And as I feel my connection to the earth, to the force of gravity, I'm reminded that down in Santa Cruz, I'm on traditional Awaswas, Ohlone, and Amamutsin territory. Just bringing to mind the people who are reviving their life ways after the disruptions of colonization, the traditional lineage holders of the area where I live. And then taking a moment to bring your attention to the breath. Just resting lightly on the sensations of the breath in the body, bringing your attention back to the breath when your attention wanders off just as a way to really arrive in the space, in your body, in the present moment. And when you feel your attention wandering, maybe getting carried away by a thought or another sense object, just release the distraction and return to the breath. And then just taking a moment to reflect on your intention for coming to our session this evening. What drew you here? Maybe you're a regular attendee of the Wednesday night Dharma Collective sessions. Maybe you were interested in the topic, talking about the emotion of anger and its relationship to compassion. Maybe you came out of curiosity to just see what was going to be shared this evening. So just taking a moment to reflect on your intention for coming, set your motivation for our time together this evening. And in Buddhist practice, we always aspire to an altruistic motivation for whatever we're doing, whether it's meditating, studying the Dharma, attending teachings. So think through my attendance in tonight's session, through our discussion, our meditation, May it benefit not only me, but bring benefit to others as well. It increased my learning and understanding so that I can bring this benefit to others as well. So setting that altruistic motivation for our time together this evening.
Great. Thank you all so much for your practice. It's great to be with you. If it's possible to turn your cameras on, for those of you joining on Zoom, it's nice to just be able to see some two-dimensional faces at least. Thank you so much. And it feels more like we're here in a community. So thank you for doing that if that's possible for you. So I wanted to, I'm a friend of Eve's. Eve and I met actually nearly 10 years ago when she taught me the Cultivating Emotional Balance teacher training. We were in a teacher training retreat in Mexico in the summer of 2013. And so Eve invited me to be with you tonight because she said, you're doing a mini series on emotions, like a little mini Cultivating Emotional Balance couple of Wednesday nights. Apparently you had our colleague Ryan with you in three dimensions a couple of weeks ago, and he's amazing. We were all leading a retreat together down in Burlingame. And so she asked me to be with you tonight to talk a little bit about the emotion of anger and some of the strategies that we can use to manage our anger and an interesting kind of correlation between these strategies for managing anger and the practice of compassion. And just a little bit of a backstory. I love talking about the emotion of anger because I really, really struggled with kind of understanding anger from a cultivating emotional balance standpoint. I'm a Buddhist monastic, have been practicing meditation since I was a hippie teenager in the early 70s, which is many, many decades ago, and in the Tibetan tradition for about 30 years. And so when I was studying in the Tibetan tradition, I would hear these statements, these translations of texts that would say things like, even one moment of anger destroys eons of positive karma. And I just like freak out, right? Like you hear these things and you're like, oh my God, the pizza delivery guy was 15 minutes late and my pizza was cold and I got ticked off and I just destroyed eons of prayers and practices and meditation. Ah! You know, and so that's the kind of thing that I was hearing. And then I went to the Cultivating Emotional Balance teacher training, and I heard a concept that if those of you who've been attending for a while might be familiar, saying all emotions can be either constructive or destructive. So we don't use the language positive and negative emotions in CEB. You know, usually we just talk about positive and negative emotions. The positive ones are the ones that feel good. The negative ones are the ones that don't feel good. But we totally wipe out that kind of classification in CEB. We talk about constructive and destructive. And then I heard Eve say, all emotions can be constructive. There can be constructive anger. And to me, that just sounded like an oxymoron. And I'm like, wait, hold up. My teachings say one second of anger can destroy eons of virtue, you know. So I really struggled with this idea of constructive anger, the function of anger, how it can manifest in a way that's constructive. So I just want to share with you tonight a little bit of my exploration of these questions and kind of where I've come to with the emotion of anger. So having said that there's such a thing of constructive anger, I think we'll all agree that anger can definitely be one of the most destructive emotions. So when we really do talk about destructive emotions, our definition is things that are destructive to our own and others' well-being. And I don't know about you guys, but I've lived long enough that I've had relationships end due to a moment of anger and me saying something super unskillful and you can't go back even five nanoseconds and take it back, right? So, we've, you know, I think we've all had moments like that when we have noticed that anger has led to a destructive episode for ourselves, maybe harmed others, definitely harmed ourselves. Anger's Anger is a really unpleasant emotion to feel, especially when we kind of hang on to it and don't move through it. Resentment has to be one of the most horrible emotions to feel, right up there with jealousy, which is also just an awful emotion to feel, like totally loser emotion, jealousy, but anger. 
So what I want to do with you tonight is share a little bit about kind of the definitions of anger, and then we're going to look at what, what are some of the triggers of anger, what's the function of anger, how are some ways we can transform. We're going to do a meditation practice where we're going to practice some of the methods of transformation. Then I want to put you into little breakout rooms for just about nine or 10 minutes or so to share what came up for you in the meditation. Then we'll come back to the bigger group and hear a little bit of feedback. I'll pause too throughout the presentation to see if there are any questions because some of you here might have grappled with this whole idea of anger just the same way that I have. So in the Cultivating Emotional Balance curriculum, the piece that's drawn from Western psychology says, the function of anger is to remove an obstacle. That's like the theme of anger, to remove an obstacle, right? And so we can think of the classic case of what can be really destructive anger, road rage, right? So somebody cuts in front of your car, you're driving along, somebody just cuts in front of you, and immediately, you don't have to think about it. It just happens. It just automatically, you know, you're like, what? I mean, you may not try and drive them off the road like some of the YouTube videos and stuff, these horrible things that you see, but probably some emotional reaction comes up. It's just automatic. We say we have that automatic appraisal of the situation. And when there's an obstacle, anger immediately comes up. There are facial expressions, tones of voice that accompany some of these primary emotions or what we call the universal emotions. Eve often talks about an experiment that was done in what she calls the golden age of psycho psychological experiments before they had ethics committees to like check out the experiments. So apparently they took six month old babies tie their little baby hands behind their backs, and then put a brightly colored toy in front of the babies, right? And the babies made classic anger. They're like, they couldn't reach the toy because their little hands were behind their back. So they're like, ah, you know, perfect anger face, anger vocalization. And then the researchers like, it didn't hurt them at all. It was no problem. And I'm like, yeah, wait, they'll be in therapy for like 25 years when they're grown up. But an obstacle to achieving what we want. So that's the theme of anger. That's the evolutionary theme of anger, which often manifests as, you know, destructive to our own, because often whatever gets in the way of us seeking out our goals, we want to eliminate, right? So you get, you yell at the person. You do unskillful actions to get that thing that you want. So that's how anger can be really problematic. So going back to this quote from, it's the guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life that I think you all studied a couple of years ago. This quote saying, even a moment of anger destroys eons of virtue. So what's going on there? So I was really investigating this question and I found this great a book by a Buddhist psychotherapist called Harvey Aronson. And he said, the problem is we're using the English word anger to refer to a bunch of different things, only one of which is what's indicated in this text. And there's, so I want to share a slide with you. I've written out these four interrelated, you know, but quite distinct definitions. So here's what Harvey Aronson, the book is called um, Buddhist Practice on Western Ground. It was published, I think, back in the 90s. I don't even know if it's still in print. Really excellent book. So he says, we use the English word anger to mean outright intent to harm, right? Like, oh, I, I was so angry, I could just kill them. Strong reactive dislike, like when somebody does something that you really, really dislike, like the pizza guy was 15 minutes late and my pizza was cold. I got so angry at him, right? Assertiveness, proclaiming difference, creating independence and setting boundaries. Oh, when my roommate went in my room and read my journal, I was so angry, right? So 
showing that a boundary has been crossed and protesting injustice. And so he said, these are four different kind of episodes that we use the word anger to refer to. So he said, only the first one is what's meant in those Buddhist texts. So when those Buddhist texts talk about like one second of anger, by the way, the fine print of that verse says towards a bodhisattva, so towards someone who is devoting their life to being of benefit to all beings, and then you intend to harm them, yeah, that's not a good idea, right? Probably not a good idea. But it doesn't mean that when the pizza delivery person is late and your pizza is cold and you get angry and have the strong reactive dislike that you're going to burn eons of, of positive karma. Okay, so that might be a relief to you. I know it was to me when I got this sort of nuance of the definition of anger. And I remember Paul Ekman, Eve's dad, one time saying, hatred is always destructive. Anger can either be constructive or destructive. And I thought that was really helpful because hatred is a little bit more of the nuance of definition number one, right? Like you really are intending to harm someone. And so Paul Ekman said, that's always destructive, never okay to intend harm. But some of the other ones can motivate us to act but we have to be super careful, even with protesting injustice. And so this is where it's important for some of these to separate the actor from the act itself, right? Separate the person from the action and be really, really careful that our anger doesn't turn into hatred and intent to harm even verbally. So we have to be really careful about that. So I want to stop sharing for a minute just because I found that so interesting. And I want to just pause for a second to see if there's any questions or comments about those four definitions before we carry on and look at some of the triggers. Any, any questions or comments about those? Let's see. I think I can see everybody if you want to raise your physical hand or your little virtual hand. Okay, so let's carry on. Let's look at some of the, the triggers of anger. And so we say, here's some of the common anger triggers. Interference and lack of efficacy. Okay, so the interference is like the baby with their little hands behind their back. Really, really common anger trigger and lack of efficacy. We might have that show up a lot in the workplace, right? You feel like your team isn't as effective, as efficient as you would like them to be. That can be an anger trigger. Disrespect, wow, big, big anger trigger when you feel that somebody disrespects you. I've, uh, up until COVID, I was teaching in prisons for about 15 years. And there was like all of this culture around what you could do or say in the slightest indication of disrespect was like, you know, behind a lot of the violence that happened in prison, really big deal. Someone trying to hurt us, right? Definite anger trigger. Another person's anger, and this is an interesting conversation I've had with Paul Ekman, who has this kind of famous thing that he says, and he says, you have to be practically a saint not to become angry when someone's angry at you. He's like, you have to be like Mother Teresa to not become angry when someone's angry at you. And I go, or a Buddhist meditator, maybe, you know, there are ways that you can transform your response even to someone else's anger with a lot of practice. Then injustice, both societal and personal, right? Disappointment in how a person has acted, big anger trigger, betrayal, abandonment, and rejection really, really big anger triggers. And we're going to look in a minute when we look at how to transform anger, some of the methods for, for transforming anger are understanding that what's underlying anger 
a lot of the time is a feeling of vulnerability. So we often say that anger is a secondary emotion. And what's more primary that we're feeling is some emotion of vulnerability. Fear, hurt feelings, betrayal, abandonment, rejection, right? All of this. Because even though it's really, really hard to feel angry and it doesn't feel good, it's way harder to feel vulnerable. We want to protect ourselves from feeling vulnerable, so we go to anger. And this is one of the questions I had for Eve when I was first studying with her. I said, okay, what obstacle are we trying to remove when we're, we go to anger as a secondary emotion to mask our fear, hurt feelings, vulnerability? And she goes, oh, the obstacle is vulnerability. So you're going to anger to avoid the feeling of vulnerability. And that made a lot of sense to me. Because like I said, even though anger doesn't feel good to feel, at least it feels like you have more control and more power, right? Than you do when you feel this kind of vulnerability. So the betrayal, the abandonment, the rejection, being falsely accused, that's a big trigger of anger also, right? Paul Ekman said something else that I, I remember him saying verbally, and I wrote it down, and I don't have the exact quote, but he said something like, anger arises when your ego feels threatened. And I thought that was a really interesting way of framing it, too. Anger arises when your ego feels threatened. So being falsely accused, what do we do? We're like, not me. I didn't do it. Right? So that's you know, one of the triggers for anger too. Also breaking a cultural rule. And this is really interesting. Think about what you feel when somebody cuts in line, like you're standing at the line. I was at the social security office yesterday and they only let like five people in the office because of COVID and it was 105 degrees and I had to stand out on the sidewalk like waiting for my turn. Well, you better believe if somebody cut in front of me, I would have had an anger episode because that breaks a cultural rule for some places, right? I've led pilgrimages in India and you know, with lots of students who know me from other countries, in India, if you're waiting, like want to buy the bus tickets, you just wait in to the fray. There's nothing like a line. You just have to wait in and reach across everybody else with your money. <laughs> the students from like North America, New Zealand, Australia, they're like, oh my God, what are you doing? And I'm like, no, this is how it happens here. So there's different cultural rules, obviously for different places. So knowing what rule you're breaking, and I know some of us might have traveled and done something that broke a cultural rule in another country or culture, and we really offended someone and they got angry and we we're just confused, right? So it, it really helps to figure out what cultural rules, you know, are in play at any place. So let's look a little bit at how we transform and then I'll pause. So hold your questions for just a second. So some of the antidotes to anger. And so what we do here is try to change our perspective. In CEB language, we talk about reappraising the trigger. So reappraisal, we have this automatic appraisal. So we're trying to counteract that automatic appraisal that gives rise to anger with a different way of thinking about it, a different way of appraising the anger trigger. So here are some things I'd like to share with you about how to do that. Putting yourself in the other person's shoes, okay? Seeing what was happening from their perspective. So many times when something happens that makes us angry, we of course think it was all about us, right? That the person did it to make us mad, in fact, they stayed up late at night trying to figure out what to do to upset us, but probably they were just trying to fulfill some need. So trying to put yourself in their shoes. What was going on for them? What need were they trying to fulfill, right? What feelings did they have about the situation? Doing that kind of perspective taking. And this is how our antidotes to anger can lead to empathy. So when we talk about empathy, 
we talk about usually two domains of empathy. We talk about affective empathy, which is kind of an emotional resonance we have with someone else's experience. And then we sometimes talk about cognitive empathy, which is perspective taking. It's this putting yourself in the other person's shoes. And often if we do that and that empathy arises, then the anger dissolves. Empathy also is a prerequisite for compassion. So we might even have compassion for the person if we put ourselves in their shoes. Our anger may even transform not only to empathy, but to compassion. So that's one way we can transform it. Just try and get out of our own head and put ourselves in the other person's shoes. Related to this, not taking it personally, right? trying to imagine that may not be all about us. There's a training that I used to do in prisons, a year long anger management and violence prevention program. And we used to give the men from a packet of Q-tips to remind them, quit taking it personally. So they'd have the physical Q-tip somewhere in their cell and we'd tell them, when you start getting mad, just look at the Q-tip and remind yourself to quit taking it personally. <laughs> For some of them, they said that was super helpful reminder. Is the other person mirroring your own unwanted qualities? So I find for myself, when I really started looking at this, often there's some aspect of our own personality that we're rejecting. And so when we see it in other people, Jung, talk, Jung talked about the shadow. We're like projecting the shadow onto other people. And then we get really, really upset when that person manifests maybe a quality in us that we're rejecting. I really looked at this when I was in a long meditation retreat. And I found if I could reframe that quality that I was rejecting in myself, that was the key to all the annoying people disappearing. It was amazing. For me, I, I noticed at one point when you're in long meditation retreat, you can get really obsessive about things. In fact, that's one of the primary characteristics of long meditation retreat for me anyway, is obsession. So at one point I actually made a list on a piece of paper of all the people I found the most annoying. And then I was like, what qualities do they have? that I find so annoying. And it was exactly like holding up a mirror to my own rejected qualities. And then I realized if I can reframe that quality in myself and see it as a gift and not just something that I'm rejecting, I might be able to turn this around. And so it was really amazing. So looking at that requires taking a little bit of responsibility. And, but with that introspection, sometimes that can be a key. And do you have a need that's not being met? What's going on for you that you're getting angry? For me, learning that anger is trying to remove an obstacle. Often when I'm angry, I really try and use it as a message to myself and ask myself the question, what am I not getting that I need? What's not working in my life? right? Even, I mean, for me, my anger mostly manifests as sort of this like low level irritability and just crankiness and like annoyance. And when I'm in a mood like that, when I get into that state, I try and really notice it and then go, oh, what's going on for me, right? There's something about my life that's not working. There's some need there that's not being met. We say that our emotions are messengers to us, giving us really important information about our lives. So I found that to be a useful question with anger. Check your expectation. This is a really big one for me. Is somebody disappointing the unwritten, unagreed upon contract that I'm, they made with me about how they're going to behave? right? We have expectations for people. We've never talked about it with them. They never agreed to it. It's just some story that lives in the privacy of our own mind. So how much is that maybe what's going on in that situation? So checking your expectation, checking for the underlying emotion. I talked about that. Often fear, 
hurt feelings, vulnerability, something like that might be going on. Is there an important message? Again, that sort of relates to, do you have a need that's not being met? Why is that anger coming up for you? Is there an important message that emotion has for you? And then keeping a healthy distance from triggering objects, okay? And this is a completely valid Buddhist technique. If in the short term, you know that being around someone or some situation is going to trigger an anger episode in the short term, while you're working on all of these other strategies for managing your anger, you are completely allowed to just avoid contact with the object. If you know it's going to trigger an anger episode, you're going to get really upset and just do something unconstructive, you're allowed to avoid the object. Not denial, not forever. Work on some of the other strategies until your mind gets stronger, and then you might be able to be in that situation again. One of the sort of metaphors for this that's found in Buddhist texts is, you know, you plant a little sapling, and then you put a little fence around it to protect it from the deer and the rabbits while it's still young and kind of tender so that you'll protect it. By the time it's grown into this big, huge oak tree, you don't need any fence around it to protect it. And our minds are like that too. So when we're just starting out with some of these strategies, try to really protect our minds from the objects that we know are gonna be triggering. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a minute and just pause to see if there's any questions or comments or reflections about some of that information, some of those strategies, some of the triggers for anger. And you can, if you're on Zoom, you can just unmute yourself. If anybody that is there in the room and wants to talk, you can just unmute the room. Any questions or comments? Yes, Claudia. Yeah, I uh, missed something when you said, is the other person mirroring your own unwanted qualities? And then you said something about transforming into a gift. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Okay, I, I will. And I will confess one of my unwanted qualities that was able to transform. So when I said that I was in retreat and I made a list of the people I found the most annoying, and then I made a list of their qualities I found the most annoying in those people, it was about being domineering and controlling, mm -hmm. which is something that I really rejected in myself, mostly because I identified it with one of my parents. Mm -hmm. And this author, Anne Lamott, who I really like, once said, you spend your whole life trying not to be one of your parents. And I found that to be a little bit true. So whenever this like really controlling, domineering side of me came out, oh, so rejecting of it. So when I saw it externally in other people, it just freaked me out and triggered anger and rejection and all the thing. So I really sat with that when I really, like I said, I made my list and it was just so clear that that was the quality. And I knew enough to know there was something to pay attention to there. And then I thought, okay, I can think of it as controlling and domineering. Or I can think of it as really kind of stubborn and determined in a good way. And then I thought, mm -hmm. would I have put everything in storage and bought a one-way ticket to India to seek my spiritual fortune without that quality? Would I have, you know, taken buses around by myself all over the world and just done these things? Would I have gone off into long solitary retreat? So that's what I mean. It was that same like energy that I could frame as either something destructive, like being domineering and controlling of other people, but it was just this sort of strength and determination and like this powerful energy that also had been a great gift to me in my life, given me all kinds of adventures, all kinds of experiences. So that's the, that's the kind of thing that I found to be super helpful, just reframing like kind of drilling down to more of a basic energy of that quality and then seeing how is it a gift for you as well? Okay. 
great. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. I found that to be, for me, a huge key to, you know, transforming these emotions, that one, and then looking at what need I have that, you know, is unfulfilled. And also the thing of seeing how anger is so much a secondary emotion and there's underlying vulnerability. Those three have been super helpful for me. Yeah. Thank you for the question, Claudia. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else have a reflection or a question? And now I can't see everybody. So you're going to need to, oh, I can go back to gallery view myself. Actually, I'm spotlighted. Yes, Adam. Hi, Tenzin. Um, hi. Hi. Um, I have a, a question that might not be for here, but I'm, I'm going to go anyway. Um, okay. You, you talked about, I heard you talk about um, vulnerability and anger and how one might supplant the other. Um, do you have any, any thoughts on when, you know, a situation where you might be so vulnerable that you aren't able to express that anger or, you know, you might not be able to express that anger at the time and then methods of constructively feeling and expressing that anger you know when it's safe to do so yeah I you know I I'm not sure if you're asking if the anger is a productive way of expressing the vulnerability are you thinking that it's a more productive way of of expressing the vulnerability or yeah I'm thinking of, of when you know, a situation where you, you know, you might be in a particularly vulnerable situation and it might have been appropriate to express anger I at see. the time rather than saying that I can't actually express anger right now because if I do, then my safety will be compromised. Yeah. Um, that productive way of expressing anger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes we go to anger because we feel threatened and it doesn't feel safe to feel vulnerable, right? Like it takes a lot of safety. It takes a really safe space in order to feel vulnerable. And as you're suggesting, sometimes anger will put us in a more dangerous position. So it really kind of depends a lot on the situation, I think, whether it'll be more appropriate to express the vulnerability or more appropriate in that moment. Maybe in the short term, we might go to anger as a way to protect ourselves from, you know, not being able to express that vulnerability. And I want to tell a story too, because this is when this whole idea of anger is the secondary emotion. So I was teaching a group of, of incarcerated men in a prison, a maximum security prison in Central California. And this is many, many years ago. And it was before I even took CEB, I was having them try to feel the emotions in their body before they, even the ones that were uncomfortable, just try and sit with the emotion with a breath awareness practice don't immediately try and distract, like even the uncomfortable ones, just to kind of train them to be with their experience a little bit. And one guy in that class, he was always coming in with a broken nose or black eyes. He sat by himself. None of the other guys would sit anywhere near him. He would like have his arms crossed over his chest, kind of glaring at me the whole time. And so I was leading them in this practice. And then the next week I went back and I said, how did it go? And this guy raised his hand and he said, well, I did that thing you said. And he goes, I've always been a really angry guy. And we're all like, yeah, duh. Like we kind of figured that out. And then he said, I did that thing you said. And I realized I'm really scared. You know, I'm always scared. And that's why I always go to anger. Well, in that safe space of that room with the group that had been meeting, working on this stuff, doing that inner work, I was thinking he could say that. I mean, the other people in the room were kind of blown away that he said that and everybody was looking at him. And I said, that was such a brave move that you even said that in this space. And the minute he walks out the door, it's gonna be safer for him to express anger right? Because he's going to be in the general population expressing fear and vulnerability isn't going to work at all. So, and I saw that, like, especially working with the prison population, this shift, like from inside the room to outside the room, in terms of what felt safe and appropriate in which, 
space. So I don't know if that sheds any light on your question or not, Adam, but sometimes we, it's almost like code switching culturally between the spaces, depending on our safety level. Does that help help clarify? Yeah, that's, that's, it wasn't a great question, but it was a good answer. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. Like what, you know, because it's interesting, there's this um, a psychotherapist who works a lot with trauma survivors. Her name's Stacy Haynes, and she has this short list of like basic human needs. I mean, some of you may have studied in nonviolent communication, there's these lists of needs, and you know, I think they're amazing and really nuanced. And I heard her give a talk once, it was a webinar actually. And she was boiling down our basic needs to a list of three that I found really powerful. And she says, safety, belonging, and dignity or, res or respect. And I'm thinking, wow, it feels to me, I've really been checking almost everything that I do is driven by a need for either safety, belonging, or respect. And all of those nonviolent communication needs, you can kind of boil down. So the need for safety is really important. And I never urge people to do something in their personal process that puts them in a position of feeling unsafe, like in that situation, to tell this guy, oh, now you've tapped into your vulnerability, just like stay there all the time. No, maximum security prison, not safe. So we always have to do what's in our, you know, what's going to keep us safe, what's in our comfort zone, and shifting from, you know, kind of situation to situation, right? Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Any other questions or comments about any of those strategies? Yeah, Mace. I mean, my struggle tends in, thank you also for all of this, is always with like those people out there that are doing this harm to this large group of people or uh, yeah. environment or whatever, right? Like, it, and it feels really compelling and really justified. And I was thinking of the antidotes and I was like, I don't know, like, I don't, you know, I, it, it, I just get really stuck and confused there. And then if the anger yeah. dissipates, yes, there's definite vulnerability under it. Right. Yeah. Well, oh, I'm a lot less vulnerable than many of the um the folks who are, you know, don't have as much privilege as I do in the world. Yeah. But there's also like then there's despair, right? Mm. Like I feel like the anger in some ways is mm. protecting despair. So I just yeah. am curious because I know you do activism and so i'm just curious yeah it feels really good to just be pissed off yeah yeah <laughs> and to blame and i was so grateful when you said because i hate those old tibetan texts i get so mad I know. Like, one second of anger and you're just like 40 million years <laughs> of karma just whatever anyways it's it's like why would anyone want to practice I'm yeah, right. Say, you just yeah. feel shame immediately. Yeah, it's and, just horrible. And it, of course, yeah. my Western ego just goes, oh, more shame? <sighs> yeah, know? totally. A hundred percent. Like you're so supposed I, to feel better, but you just go into a shame spiral every time yeah. you open up yeah. one of these texts. And I appreciate that clarification, but there are times where I've just been like, there's some people on the planet who I think the planet would be far better off if they yeah. were not here. Yeah. I mean, obviously yeah. other people will come and fill their shoes because that seems to be the way it goes. But so a lot of people that could be dissipated. Um, so I don't know. That's just my like confessions of a, you know, <laughs> sort of. Well, just to say, I think you are not alone. I think there you have many companions in the struggle, including me. And I feel like this is like, to me, this is the huge question mark in compassion practice like many I teach the Stanford compassion training also and so many people come to like week one of the eight-week class thinking of the hardest case and feeling resistance to engaging in compassion practice because they feel like that edge of that ferocity and that 
protesting injustice will somehow go away. They're afraid that by doing compassion training, they'll lose the edge, lose that strong wish for a more just, compassionate world. So I'll just tell you a little bit of where I am with this. For me, it feels really, and then Alfred, I see your hand up. We'll get to you in just one second. To me, it really feels like the key is separating the person from the actions, fiercely opposing, standing up loud and clear against harmful actions, but not holding hatred in our hearts for the perpetrator, right? And for me, the empathy is the key. I'll mention just because we might still be thinking about him. And I'm sorry if anybody has different politics than me, but for me, our former president was a really classic example. And I really worked hard because I don't believe it's okay to hate anyone. (laughs) And I disagreed with every move he made for like years and still do. And then when I saw, wow, I mean, in my perspective, and again, I hope I'm not offending anybody. I'm just talking about like using that as an example of my struggle. What a wounded, wounded individual, like somebody who's so wounded, who ha- whose need for affirmation is like a black hole, can never be fulfilled, and is just the constant motivation for everything. And then I could be like, oh, my God, like how awful. Here's a trauma survivor, clearly 100%. So I could open to a little compassion for the person who I could see as a survivor of incredible, probably abuse, for sure, trauma, if only verbal, all the things, classic narcissistic wounding going on. And I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that every policy that he wants to put in place doesn't happen, right? And it's tricky. It's really tricky because often our, and, I, I, and I'll share something at that time, I went, I went to a, a protest march and it was actually when Jeff Sessions was still the attorney general. So it was really early on and I was in Sacramento and Jeff Sessions was visiting Sacramento right after some horrible immigration ban had been put into effect like the day before. And so with this interfaith contingent of all of these faith leaders like heading this march, and then there were people with bullhorns. And then at a certain point, they were actually chanting. I mean, they were chanting whose streets, our streets and the whole thing that we chant. And then they started chanting these things about Jeff Sessions looks and comparing him to the Keebler elf. And at that moment, I was like, okay, no. I was like, if your child did that on the playground, that would be called bullying. Like, not okay to make fun of somebody personally, to make fun of their looks. That's when I kind of checked out. I mean, I was still there at the action, but I'm like, we don't need to go there. Let's just talk about the policy. Let's not make fun of the person He can't help the way he looks. So it's that, the difference there. And I actually kind of around the same time find myself like not watching so many of the late night hosts because I found them, they just like make fun of the person. And I'm like, not cool, not cool. Again, if your kid did that at school, you'd have a stern talk to them. So why is it okay to do that with somebody whose policies we disagree with? And it's hard. So that's a little bit of, you know, where like trying to separate, which isn't easy, but it doesn't mean either that you, it doesn't mean either that you lose the power of your opposition to the policy while you're still holding compassion to the person. So it doesn't make you a wimp and it doesn't mean that our, opposition to what we see as wrong is dependent on blame either, which isn't healthy for us or anybody, if that makes sense. That's just, that's just where I'm aspiring to in my own life and practice, but awesome question. Cause that always, always comes up. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 
Alfred, sorry for the long-winded answer, but it was a super important question. I, I like long-winded answers, and I, I like your Trump conversation. Um, could you shift, shifting gears, could you talk a little bit or shed some light on the relationship between anger and grief and profound loss? Yeah, yeah. And often, again, I think it's really hard for us to manage the vulnerability of grief. So we go to anger, we're protesting. Why did it happen? It's so unfair. It shouldn't have happened. It's a way of protecting ourselves from the sadness of the loss, right? And feeling that energy of anger. And we really need to go through the sadness of the loss eventually too. And it may be that it's just too hard to go there right away. And we need to use the anger to protect ourselves because the loss was just too huge, mm. right? But in understanding and being, well, I, I'm gonna lead, uh, lead you through practice and part of, part of what's so important and why this conversation also relates to self-compassion is, yeah, in that way, anger is a useful, maybe a constructive emotion because maybe we really can't handle the depth of the grief when it's fresh. And so that anger is helping to protect us. And eventually, you know, we need to shift and really feel the depth of the grief and the loss, but maybe not right away. Maybe the anger is serving that function to protect us in that moment. Makes sense, yeah. like taking steps. That's right. Going through the fog to get at the answer. Absolutely, that's right, that's right. So not blaming ourselves because anger for us can, I mean, it's interesting. I think anger has a reciprocal relationship with shame. Often shame triggers anger because we're trying to protect ourselves from the vulnerability of feeling shame, but often we feel shame about feeling angry too, right? <laughs> so it's got this interesting kind of relationship both before and after, but it's often connected to shame. In fact, I remember saying once to Eve, that I felt that shame perhaps was underlying all destructive emotions. I said, I'm just gonna take a wild, make a wild generalization. Maybe shame is underlying all destructive emotions. And she looked at me for a long moment because of course this is not backed up by research, but she said, you may not be wrong <laughs> there, right? which is about as good as I can get if I haven't done a double blind study with like Stanford researchers, right? Yeah. But it's an interesting question for me too, is shame is like the ultimate vulnerability and how much is that underlying some of these other emotions too. But in terms of grief, I think it's just protecting us from getting, and it's almost like what Mace was saying about despair, right? Also the, the anger is protecting us from despair, which we're afraid is just going to be overwhelming to us. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Great question. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else before we go into practice? Any other comments? Okay. So what I want to do is lead you through a practice. First, I'm going to introduce it. It's a practice you might be familiar with. Uh, I'm going to share my screen again for a second. Hopefully it's the next slide. Oh, sorry. One anger antidote sort of relates to what we've just been talking about, cultivating loving kindness and compassion. I didn't click down far enough on the slide. So cultivating loving kindness and compassion, which are the opposite to hatred. And then what I want to do is introduce you to a practice called by an acronym RAIN. It was developed by a group of insight teachers, especially Michelle McDonald Smith, maybe, gosh, probably like about 15 years ago now. It's really been popularized by the teacher Tara Brock. And there's lots of YouTube videos. She has a lot of information on her website about this practice. And it's about, it's a practice that enables us to be with difficult emotional experience. So I want to take you through the steps of the practice. Recognize, allow, 
investigate and the original framing was non-identification. Tara Brock has changed it to nurture. So let's talk about these and then I'll guide you through a guided practice. So recognize is just about recognizing what is being experienced, right? In the practice that we're gonna do, I'm gonna ask you to draw from memory and remember an anger episode. But of course, in the moment when you're having a challenging emotional experience in the moment, it's just stopping and recognizing. You might recognize what physical sensations there are in your body. You might name the emotion. You might identify a little bit what the emotion is, right? But it's stopping and being with. And remember my story about my incarcerated student, really hard for him to be with that feeling of anger. He would immediately punch somebody in the face try and distract himself, just try and get out of it because it felt so uncomfortable. So this teaches us how to be with and then allow that feeling. So just sitting with it. This is one of the things that Nace may be able to relate to this. I felt like with a lot of the Tibetan teachings on emotions or mental afflictions, they would tell you to an apply an antidote immediately. And I felt like I need to get the message first. I need to figure out what's going on and really get the message of that emotion. I can't apply an antidote until I've like sat with it for a while and just felt it. I don't need it to motivate some unskillful action. I'm not gonna go there, but unless I get the information, the emotion hasn't given me its message. So allowing, sometimes that's all you need. With my student who realized that fear was underlying his anger, all he did was the recognize and allow. And then he got the insight and the whole thing kind of unraveled. By the way, after that episode, he completely transformed. The minute he realized fear was underlying his anger, he used to sit in the front row, raise his hand all the time. It was kind of an amazing transformation when he connected to that vulnerability that was underlying the emotion. Then investigate with a soothing presence. Tara Brock says, investigate with kindness. So what we're going to do at this step of the meditation is just go over some of those ideas about how to reappraise, how to reframe that anger episode. See if any of those are true. So this is where we ask questions. Is there some underlying storyline going on there? Did I have an expectation that wasn't met? Do I have a need that's not being met? That's where we ask ourselves the questions to try and get some insight into what's behind the emotion. And it's important with a soothing presence. So as I mentioned, not making ourselves wrong that we're having the emotion, not going into shame about having the emotion. And then the last step, originally it was framed as non-identification, meaning Reminding yourself that you're not the emotion. You're having the emotional experience, but you are not anger. The emotions come and go. They're not permanent. They're not a fixed part of who you are, right? And then Tara Brock changed it to nurture because I think she realized that having kindness and self-compassion in this moment when you're working with strong emotions was really important. So we're going to do both steps. So I'm gonna guide you through. I'm gonna ask you to draw from memory of an anger episode. And I advise you on a scale of one to 10, don't pick a 10, pick a three or four on a scale of one to 10. I really need not to have even a Zoom room full of furious people and it's not gonna do much good. So pick something that's kind of moderate, something that you can identify as anger and it might be like I said, on the scale of irritation, annoyance, you know, irritability, that kind of level of anger, maybe not fury or rage, don't go there, go to a mild or moderate, and then we'll do the practice and investigate. And then we'll have some time. I'm not sure if we're even going to have time for breakout rooms. We might just debrief as a bigger group. Let's see how we go. So go ahead and get into your posture that's comfortable for about 15 minutes or so of sitting practice with your back straight, your shoulders even, 
your tongue on the roof of your mouth, right behind your teeth. Your hands can be resting in your lap or resting on your knees. And then just checking into your body the way that we did at the beginning of the session, just moving your attention through, checking for any tightness or tension or constriction, and deliberately releasing and relaxing. And then just taking a few moments with the breath, just to settle your mind. Just returning your attention to your breath over and over when it wanders. And now I invite you to draw from your memory of an experience that you had with anger and remembering to choose an episode that's mild to moderate. It could be something that happened recently, so it's fresh in your mind. If there are a couple of different options, just Pick one episode for now for this practice. And then let the details become clear in your mind. Think about who was there, if anyone, what happened, details about what was said, what was done. And one of the triggers of emotion is memory. So you might find as you're thinking about this incident that you're reliving this episode, you might notice that you're being mildly triggered again to anger. And notice what does that feel like in your body? Recognize, you might want to name exactly which emotion you're feeling. Maybe it is annoyance or irritability, some other flavor of anger. You feel anything in your belly, maybe your jaw, maybe your hands. Just notice as you re-trigger that emotion, what does it feel like in your body and what kind of thoughts are going through your mind? Maybe you notice that you're justifying the anger that you experienced in that episode. And you might notice when that experience of anger starts to arise, you might notice your impulse to push it away, maybe suppress it, maybe distract yourself. We often don't want to feel these emotions that feel uncomfortable. But just allow, just anchor with the breath and allow that emotional experience to be there. Just noticing, just being with it, just allowing.
And then the next step is investigating and investigating with kindness. So as we investigate, just be aware not to blame yourself for how you're feeling, or if you get some insight into what underlies that anger, not to feel like it's a weakness or you're a failure. So investigate with kindness and curiosity. And to express that kindness towards yourself, it may be helpful to adopt some kind of soothing gesture, maybe putting one hand or both hands on your heart or one hand on your heart and one on your belly just to support you in this inquiry. And so first, as you recall that episode, was there some underlying emotion, some feeling of vulnerability? Maybe as a more primary emotion, maybe anger was secondary. Maybe you felt unworthiness or fear or hurt feelings or shame. Is there a way that your anger in that episode was protecting you from a feeling of vulnerability? And then put yourself in the other person's shoes. So see if you can take their perspective. And it may just be a guess. You maybe don't know. But what was behind the action for them? If there was somebody else involved, and usually anger involves someone else, how, what kind of need from their side were they trying to fulfill? Soliness, the Dalai Lama says, everybody's trying to find happiness and avoid suffering. Sometimes people do it in dysfunctional ways, but can you guess at what they might have needed in that moment? What was going on from their perspective? So this is the cognitive empathy, putting yourself in their shoes. And related to this, is there a way that you're just taking this so personally? Maybe when you put yourself in the other person's shoes, you get an insight that you weren't that important in the whole situation. Maybe you were very peripheral, but you got angry because you were taking it personally, acting as if that action was directed towards you. How does that? help to transform the anger for you. And then the next thing to check, is that person expressing some quality that you're rejecting in yourself? Maybe you're seeing that it's becoming exaggerated in your perception and you're feeling aversion. 
because that's actually a part of your own personality. You find it hard to accept. To remember my example about kind of controlling, domineering people. Might that be true? And is there a way that you might be able to reframe that quality? Perhaps see it as a gift. But for this part of the practice, just see, is there something in yourself that you're experiencing in other people and finding it triggering? And then check, is there some expectation that you had of the person that was disappointed? Did you feel there was something you expected of them that they didn't fulfill? Might that be behind your feeling of anger? Just check. And so after the step of investigation, then comes non-identification. And so remembering that emotions come and go, they're triggered by events, either external or internal. Often we feel so stuck in our emotional experience. But just realize even this memory of anger, even the emotion you might be feeling right now, It's happening in this spacious nature of mind, this clear awareness. So just feel that spacious nature of your mind. The thoughts come and go, the feelings come and go, the emotions come and go, all within that space of your mind. And then the nurturing piece again, realizing we have emotions because we're human. We evolve these emotions. They all have a function. They're there to protect us, to give us information. So have a sense of kindness towards yourself in your investigation of your emotional life. Trying to just Become aware and transform our emotions, not get rid of them. They're nothing to reject. So feel that quality of nurturing along with that spacious awareness. And then release the thought process and just return to the breath for a few moments, just really feeling the sensations of the breath in your body, coming back to the present moment, releasing that memory.
just take a moment to relax your posture and gently come out of meditation, come back to the space. Okay. So I think we've actually run out of time for the <clears throat> breakout room, which for some people may be a relief. Often that's when people disappear from the Zoom rooms. <laughs> but I'd love to hear maybe in the time that we have left, if there's any reflections or insights from that practice that you would like to share or any questions that came up, anything that seemed helpful at all in that practice. Just unmute and share. I'd love to hear some reflections. Okay. Maybe I should put you into small groups. Maybe you'll be more willing to talk. <laughs> All right, I'll put you into small groups for six minutes. How about that? And then you can share with each other and it won't be on the, well, oh, yep, we lost somebody. That always happens. I'll put you into small groups for just about six minutes or so, and then you can share and then we'll come back.
Okay, everybody's going to be coming back in a second. How was that? Did you have fun? Always have fun. Good. Whenever possible. <laughs> That's a good strategy. I like that. Try, try to laugh as much as possible. Yes. This too, even if it's tough and it's a diff, diff it's, this too shall pass. I have an interesting rule. Will this matter in two minutes, two hours, two weeks, two years? Mm. That's a good way to change one's perspective, isn't it? It helps. I like that. Well, yeah. Easy to say, hard to do. <laughs> so any comments or reflections from your from your experience? Yeah, Adam. Ah, yeah, I had a so I, yeah. Thanks, Tens. I had a question. Um, I, I'm not going to bore everyone with my full story. Um, but I, you know, I had an incident with a neighbor and um, she, she was sunbathing immediately outside my window and taking a call and I could hear everything and it was distracting and I asked her to leave just to take the call elsewhere and she refused. And I got angry and I wondered if it's possible, talking about the mirror, you know, we get angry at people because we see in a, a, a characteristic or quality in them that we don't like about ourselves. Is it, can you experience anger? Because I actually admired like the chutzpah that she had that I don't have. And it was, I was a, like resentful because she stood her ground. Ah. And, uh, not being, you know, the most respectful thing. I wish I could assert my rights in that way, like she did. Wow, that is such an interesting insight, Adam. That's, you know, and I'm wondering if it was almost to go back to that theme of like, maybe even shame or vulnerability that you aren't like that. So you responded with anger because it was like, oh, I want to be like that. Mm. So it was almost like a sense of envy gave rise to the anger. I mean, one thing anger can just, we can just go back to the basic thing of there's an obstacle. You wanted a quiet hour and then this woman is just talking loudly. I mean, sometimes it's really basic like that. And then the, all of these methods that I introduced to transform, it's like, no, you're just not getting something that you need, which is just peace and quiet. But I think that's such an interesting insight to could almost envy in a way be one of those vulnerable emotions that leads to anger i would love to think about that more that's given me a whole nother approach to transformation so awesome thank you never never i've never had anyone make a comment like that and i've never actually thought of it myself but it feels just instinctively it feels like yeah that could totally be true what does everybody else think claudia is nodding that feels like that could totally be a thing. We get angry at someone else for having a quality that we admire and don't feel that we have enough of. Yeah, thank you, Adam. They've, You've given me a whole they've nice got thing. something I want. Yeah, yeah. So the, so the- A little envy, was, maybe envy or something like that. Yeah, because I think envy and jealousy are very vulnerable emotions to feel. One of my teachers, um, Zongzer Kensu Rinpoche, when he talks about jealousy, he goes, jealousy, it's such a loser emotion. He goes, you don't feel good. The other person doesn't feel good. It doesn't really amount to anything. It never gets you what you want. In fact, the total opposite. <laughs> I mean, it's really funny to see, hear him like go into this rant about jealousy. And it feels so unpleasant that I could imagine if we were feeling jealousy, going to anger to save ourselves from the obstacle of how unpleasant, you know, jealousy and envy are to feel. So I think that could definitely be a thing. Great. I'm going to have to add another bullet point to my slide. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. How does that feel? Does that feel like it's ringing true maybe a little bit? Yeah, I, I think so. I think there's a bit of the, a bit of the jealousy and, and, you know, now that I'm, you know, reflecting, I think is there's a little bit of projecting. Um, I, I don't know. This is this is getting a, a bit layered, and I know we're running out of time. But also, like, why have someone has crossed my boundaries? Why have I, I let that happen again? You've done yeah. that. 
That's right. That's right. And that was one of the ones in that list by Harvey Aronson, like an anger trigger is like a boundary has been violated. That's like a really fundamental anger trigger too, when we feel like a boundary has been violated. And we're like, hey, stay out. You know, it's a literal like trying to remove an obstacle of somebody encroaching somehow on our boundaries. So then the question there is, okay, we might still feel the anger, but then how do we manifest it constructively? Not screaming out the window and throwing pots and pans on her head, but like, is there some way that you can assert a boundary skillfully? And then that's an entirely different workshop that I actually do with a friend. <laughs> we developed a day long called Compassionate Boundaries. Like how do we balance being compassionate with setting clear boundaries? Cause that's a whole strategic question in and of itself, but thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. So now, now we're definitely out of time. It would be so great to unpack more of this, you know, but I, I would love a takeaway, you know, if we can kind of take the other person's perspective and get insight into our own triggers, it's a way of moving from anger to compassion and self-compassion, like with that insight piece, with the putting ourselves in the other person's shoes and the insight we have into our own anger triggers, that's a way we can move from the stuckness of anger, the destructiveness of anger to go, hey, how can I move towards compassion with this and self-compassion? So there's a lot more to do. There's a lot more to be said about that. But it's been really a great experience for me to be with you all here on Zoom. Hopefully I can be there in three dimensions in your beautiful new space that I'm enjoying seeing in the one little Zoom cube there at some point in the future. And I really appreciate your time and attention this evening. If